There we go. Now we're recording. Okay, I'm going to switch this view here. All right, so cool. Let's just try this again and see what happens. Okay, um, I can edit all this out now. So this will force, this will force me to edit it all. <laughs> so here we are. Uh, we got the screencast real quick. This is with um, a good friend of mine and a colleague that I really respect, Leon Fedden. So Leon studies with me at Goldsmiths University. Uh, he's a year ahead of me, so he's just finishing up his master's degree. And he's just really into machine learning. So he's um, somebody that I highly regard as uh, he wouldn't call himself an authority on machine learning. But to me, he's an authority. Um, I would probably put him and then I'd probably ask uh, one of my professors, Rebecca Freebrink, who's like a goddess of machine learning. <laughs> she really is like a uh, she's one of the probably foremost authorities on creative machine learning practices in the field i would think everyone knows her and respects her like, yeah so you see her face just on any video talking about machine learning um you know able to you know ableton has has her featured on videos and just everybody everybody loves rebecca she's yeah. like the nicest yeah. person as well <laughs> but um hi rebecca if you're watching this <laughs> but um yeah, so Leon is a really a person I really respect uh, in terms of uh, somebody that really knows a lot about machine learning, and he created these projects that were really fascinating to me. Um, well, 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 let me say this first. Uh, Leon was like a really uh, I'm, I'm just really glad to have Leon on the channel because he's one of the people that really first inspired me to do the channel. Um, basically, when I was going through my second year in um, at Goldsmiths, I was looking for uh, C++ audio tutorials and uh, tutorials on doing audio processing and open frameworks and Maximilian Sound Library. And Leon really only had one of the only um, tutorials out there for, uh, for audio programming or C++ audio. And um, so he was, he was really an inspiration to me. So thank you for that, Leon. And, um, and all the... Uh, and all the other people that uh, that have benefited from that uh, at Goldsmiths, uh, they thank you as well. <laughs> get, on, get on and document the bloody Maximilian Library. That that needs to be done. But honestly, it's just been so nice to watch your channel grow and all the hard effort that you've put in doing your talks and just all your videos. It's just such a lovely thing to see you getting the attention you deserve. So well done to you too. Oh, thanks a lot, man. Thanks a lot. And hopefully it'll grow more because, uh, and, and one of the reasons that I think it could grow even more is because we've got Leon on board now and he's going to do a uh, machine learning series, creative machine learning and um, teach us a little bit about what machine learning is and some creative ways that we can use it in the audio field and um and you know so it's going to be um i think really useful for people that are looking to kind of get their feet wet with machine learning and um maybe before we talk about what machine learning is we can maybe explore just some of the creative possibilities some of the stuff that i've just seen you do with machine learning that was really fascinating to me um so we were talking about uh this project that you did for your third year at goldsmiths uh where um you had kind of three parts to the project that were really fascinating to me. One part was where you have, let's just say that you have a sound that um, you get from like one of your favorite tracks and it's a synth patch and you want to recreate that, that sound. Yes. Basically Leon created a way. I don't, I don't know if you were the first to do it, but um, you did, <laughs> but, but you, but you, um, but you basically created a way that you could um, re use a n neural network to resynthesize that sound, and so, so, so basically, you don't have you have no idea what the synth patch, um, how to create the synth patch. You can basically run it through a neural network, and on the other side, you have a synth patch that you can play in a synthesizer. Hold on, I'm just going to close this door real quick. <laughs> Okay, I'm back. 
I would probably say that I was definitely not the first person to do it, um, mm. but my supervisor is part of probably like the 12 music types of weirdos who live around the world and now I'm part of them, one of them who, who just really cared about automatically programming the synthesizers and before I did it, everyone was using genetic algorithms and various other things and mm. I think I was the first one to use neural networks to try and do that and that you can do it very well with other meta heuristics like genetic algorithms but the problem with these kind of solutions is it takes a very long time to find each new uh, synthesizer patch for each sound um, whereas a, you just train a neural network once and then it's 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 done you know you can query it as much as you want and it's very very quick to query which enables the application of actually releasing this in production rather than requiring the user to have a supercomputer to run their ga uh, mm. each time they want a new synthesizer patch Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. So, you know, you can imagine probably a year or two from now, there will probably be a VST from Native Instruments or somebody that I will. That I should plug at this point, I just say that Matthew Yi King was my supervisor. I just say that he was the creative and technological genius who pushed me to do this stuff. You know, it's his idea and yeah. he, he deserves all the credit, really. Yeah, Matthew E. King's the man. He's my project supervisor as well, so um, hopefully some of the genius will rub off on me. <laughs> um, Matt, Matt's the man, definitely. Um, so, so yeah, so so I, w I would imagine, um, you know, a couple of years from now, you'll probably see one of the bigger companies that will release uh, some some kind of VST that will enable you to basically recreate any sound um, just for just from a sample you you have some some kind of sample that you take from the song it could probably create a synthesizer patch just from that from that sound I think the thing, just going back to that sentence you can do it in two ways can't you you know you can either um, have a not a VST but a VST host that takes an arbitrary VST mm -hmm. and it takes the sound and then it learns to program that VST to recreate whatever sound you want in that VST. Hmm. Or just say, well, to hell with all VSTs, I'll just make a VST that can make any sound. And you know, you give it the sound and it generates similar sounds that sound just like that. And that, that would be a kind of different approach. But I mean, I guess we can get into that later. Yeah, um, yeah. But just off what you said. Yeah. It's more of a VST host in a way. Hmm. And, uh, and there, was a, there was a second part to, the project where basically you had uh, a synthesizer with some parameters, then what you could do is you could basically run it through a neural network where it would be able to create every combination of from every parameter in that synthesizer and basically create every sound that that synthesizer is able to, uh, to create. Um, and then you did another part where you were able to put that on like a three dimensional point cloud where you could basically twist the point cloud and then click, you click on one of the points and then it would be a preset. Similar sounds would be like clustered together. So if you had like a sound that you were like quite like that sound, it's not exactly what I want. Then basically you click in that area mm. and it would have similar sounds or you say, that's nothing like what I want. Then you go to a different area and you can, um, for the second part is more <clears throat> throwing away the neural network and just looking at every possible set of sounds. So, for example, I built this VST host in Python, mm. and you, you basically can send in the arbitrary parameters that you want. So, say you have five parameters, and each parameter can take on any one of 128 numbers. Mm. You, know, you, you have all these potential um parameter settings that you could have and you make a lot of them maybe not all of them because i don't think i have enough hard drive space to store these things on <laughs> and you make all these audio samples of these parameter settings and then you take these audio samples and try and condense them down into a three-dimensional point and cluster them in a space where similar sounds are in closer regions to one another mm -hmm. that was the idea and then you could explore this space with your mouse and find similar sounds and look at the parameter settings of these sounds, I guess, if you know what I mean. It's like a 
But I'm, I'm not the first person to do that. Gene Kogan was doing that, um, and I'm sure countless more have done it that I'm simply ignorant of. Um, mm. But yeah. You don't have to be the first, you just have to do it the best. <laughs> 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 um, <Yep. laughs> you bring up a great name, Gene Kogan. Gene Kogan is a uh, is. Uh, I mean, I think I could say that he's a pioneer in. Yeah. Um, in with Rebecca, I yeah, that. yeah, yeah. He's up there with Rebecca. Um, <clears throat> he definitely be, he'd definitely go on the Mount Rushmore of creative machine learning uh, yeah. for me. And um, Gene Kogan, if you don't know him, he's done. Um, he's just a genius for neural networks and creative applications for machine learning. So if you, uh, you know, he does this stuff like where you have like a picture of Mona Lisa and you have like the starry night by Vincent van Gogh. And then you could basically run a neural network on it and you have a Mona Lisa in the style of uh, starry, starry night or starry night in the style of Mona Lisa. Um, you know, so, yeah, really crazy possibilities that I think are going to really change the world of art as well. <laughs> you know, I, mean, like, I would totally check out uh, his Cubist Mirror uh, project. He's also been in, uh, pushing the deep dreaming technique into sort of new and interesting ways, and that's worth reading about. I think he had an entry into uh, NIPS 2017. It's a conference mm -hmm. on neural information processing. That was a really great paper. Um, and yeah, but his Cubist Mirror, I saw that in Korea and it was this, you know, it has this webcam and it was my, it's the first time I've seen real time, um, uh, what's, what's the word for it? I've got what's the term? Um, image, not image similarity. I've totally forgotten what it's called. Um, I, I, I know what you mean, but maybe the other people don't. <laughs> maybe we could just call it like imitation. Um, style transfer. You know, Sorry. Yeah. yeah, style transfer. It's the first yeah, time style I've transfer. Used in a real time manner. I've seen it used on videos. Mm. The idea of you sitting and standing in front of this uh, screen with a webcam and it's turning you into a Picasso drawing. Yeah. You know, it's so cool. And that's such a nice way to bring machine learning into the real world within a artistic and interesting context yeah to me that just that just changes in the world of art you know just really i mean you know it, it brings up possibilities of you know you being able to develop your artistic style and now you have now you now you have the possibilities of kind of a interactive or two-way um you know two-way communication where you know, you can have a subject that comes into your pick that, that comes into your art installation or into your onto your webcam and that you're basically able to kind of give them a piece of art that's really like their own almost, you know, yeah. but in your style. I mean, that is just incredible. Um so so yeah, so there are a lot of possibilities of machine learning. It really, you know, it really makes me think of just kind of the past couple of years, I feel like, you know, VST development and audio development has kind of, I don't want to say stagnated because there are a lot of really interesting things that are coming out. But in terms of like, when you think, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, the synthesizers become a little bit better. They become a little bit kind of different, you know, but, you know, a lot of those are really kind of building on existing models that have kind of existed since the 60s and 70s. Yeah, you know, sure. Now we're talking about whole different, you know, entirely different workflows, entirely different possibilities that really just take the world of VST development and just kind of just kind of throw out the book and now you're in like a whole different dimension of creativity. Um, yeah, you're right. There's been very few synthesis methods that I'm aware of that have really been come into the book. <clears throat> mm. um, I, think, I think cross synthesis really is something that I'm surprised I don't really see a whole lot of, you know, whereas like you have a sound of a tuba, then you have a sound of a, I don't know, a saxophone or something. And then, you know, you cross synthesize those and now you have something that's kind of somewhere between a tuba and a saxophone, you know, how, I, I, go ahead. That, that's, that's 
kind of what uh, and the Ensynth project. So there's a subsidiary of Google, their creative machine learning stuff called Magenta, Project Magenta. And yeah. They, they made this exact thing that you're talking about. Mm. You know, you can just take two samples and, you know, fade the amplitude or, or, or some, or maybe through frequency shifting or sorry, morphing. But, you know, there, there may be a better way to go between one sound and another, and that may be through an internal representation of that sound within a neural network. Mm. You know, that's where there are, you're, I think, where you're going with the sort of new and interesting direction to take VST development, you know, build these new types of synthesizers that work in a sort of fundamentally different way. You know, mm. your audio synthesis is this weird and fantastic world of making novel sounds. I mean, one of the great things about art and machine learning is machine learning is enabling these things that humans wouldn't, you know, it's, it's not getting rid of humans within mm. art, but it's, mm. it's bringing these new tools to enable us to make these new images that we wouldn't otherwise really come up with unless we had these really warped and abstract brains. Mm -hmm. and no one's, so for example, there's this uh, pix to pix model that uh, turns sketches, line drawings into pictures of cats. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you can just draw a cat and it will turn that line drawing into a pretty, you know, you could tell it's a cat, how yeah. it's hair, whatever. But, the really interesting things come when you start drawing pictures of lemons or trees, and then you have these cat trees or <laughs> cat. it's kind of bizarre things that just people wouldn't really come up with by themselves. And I think the same can be applied to audio in many ways. Mm. I'm not sure how I make a lot of the neural audio stuff by hand, <laughs> but you know, yeah. I make it a happy accident with the neural network, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah. Well, we were, we were talking before, uh, this is like our third or fourth <laughs> edit of this video. <laughs> so we're rehashing over a lot of stuff we did before, but we were talking about like with, with the, uh, with the browsing example that, um, Leon had done on a 3d point cloud about, you know, taking, because, um, you know, if we look at browsing systems and DAWs, uh, for, for sounds and presets, I mean, you know, to me is quite rudimental or rudimental. Yeah. Rudimentary. Yeah. <laughs> same, same thing. <laughs> um, uh, rudimentary, you know, in that, you know, we're still kind of relegated to the same style that, that has been, has existed since the early eighties, which has been go into a file, you know, go into a folder, go into some, fo some fold, uh, subfolder that says, you know, kicks and then go into that and then it'd be like house kicks or deep kicks or hard kicks and then go into that. Then you're scrolling down that to me, like if somebody's really looking for an area where they're like, you know what, I don't know, you know, I want to do something with audio and I don't know what to do. That to me yeah. is like a great place to focus because, you know, and, there might be some house songs that have quite hard kicks or whatever. There's no reason why a folder of, hard kicks might not cross over some of those kicks might fit quite well in other sets and you know it definitely seems like the wrong way to categorize them is you want to do them by sound similarity or so that would be an interesting way to do it yeah yeah i mean imagine if it was like cluster you know like on on like a cluster like a like a point cloud like what leon had made but where it's like you don't have to do it in three dimensions if i could just <laughs> you could do it in like one dimension just like the Essentially, when you're spamming down and just listening to all these kicks, mm. instead of just having this just folder with kicks in, imagine if it was sorted in a similar way. I, mean, I don't know how you do that on a Mac. You could do it yeah. on Linux, but I mean, maybe Mac would have something to say about that. But it would be an interesting project, for sure. Yeah. Um, makes makes me think of ar and vr as well you know in terms of like what if you could what if you actually had an environment where you could actually walk you know like like where it was an actual kind of almost physical space where you could walk over to sounds and touch them and then you know like these sounds are like quite similar but if i walk in into in the middle of like this cluster and this cluster maybe it'd be a sound that would be somewhere in between or maybe i could take two sounds and i could even create a third sound that would be somewhere in between um yeah so yeah just thinking out there way out there <laughs> For me, AR is the way to go. I've seen a VR mm. um, implementation built in Unity. Mm. That that was made by a friend of mine at university who took my work. Oh. Um, and 
it it basically took took the the point cloud and put it in a VR system, and you know it was just pulling sounds and finding similar sounds and that. Even though it's quite a sort of an early basic concept, I think you could definitely go with that and work with that and make yeah. these interesting interfaces to play with sounds. Yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's really what it's all about. I mean, we tend to you know when a new technology comes out it tends to be quite like haptic hap I think the words haptic um, at first in that, you know, we tend to just kind of use the technology in kind of the same way that we used to use old technology. Like if you look at like iPhones, like when, when the first like iPhone um, icons and the representations came out, it was like kind of like representations of what we would normally see like in a physical space. Um, yeah. But now as time, what's now- well, so, that? Called skeuomorphic design, I think. I think that's is that what it's called? <laughs> yeah, but now as time moves forward, you know, then it's like we get further away from that, and then it kind of becomes its own identity, doesn't it? You know, I'm seeing that in um, in VR as well. Like I've seen uh, somebody in our group that is doing like a, um, it's a. Akai, it's, it's an Akai MPC, a, a, a VR version of it. And um, <clears throat> that's really cool. That's awesome. Uh, it, you know, because once again, we tend to go to the interfaces that we know, that's the interfaces that we've seen in physical space. But imagine what it's going to be like, you know, five, 10 years from now, um, what kind of drum machines they're going to be at with some really wild, crazy. I hope these new interesting designs. I mean, Obviously, the tried and tested ones have been around for so long too. So maybe hmm. it works. Then you know, don't I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see, won't we? We'll see. What yeah, happens. we will see. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I think it'd be good for us to talk a little bit, just in terms of you know, because I think I've said that. I think I've said this already, but um, Leon's going to be doing a series that's going to be on creative machine learning and just really taking from the beginning, talking about differences between things like classification and regression and maybe supervised learning versus unsupervised learning and talking about some of those differences and creative practical creative applications from the beginning. So it's not going to like just throw you into, you know, the <laughs> deep end. <laughs> We're not going to just throw you into the deep end like that, but just some, um, you know, some, some really simple ways that we can get started. But, um, you know, one thing that I, I don't think that we've talked about yet in this conversation is just about machine learning and just kind of how it differs a little bit from conventional computing. Can you briefly explain that again, since this is yeah. our third, our third edit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so often um, when we're coding, we are faced with a problem and we would have to code the solution. And sometimes it's not immediately apparent as to what that solution might be. But mm. let's say that I have a bunch of examples of what that solution would be. And I then want a machine to automatically learn that thing rather than me explicitly programming it. So, mm. I mean, I, machine learning, tersely, is... It's a, it's a subset of artificial intelligence. It's not all of artificial intelligence, although some people will have you think that. Mm -hmm. um, it's based on statistical techniques that learn from data. And it's basically allowing us to optimize a task mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, without explicitly having to program a solution, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'll bring up a different example than I did in the, than I well in the previous <laughs> versions of this video. Um, so let's say, let's say that you have a picture, like let's say it's a bunch of pictures of me and that um, you basically want to identify when I'm in a picture. Um, what you could do is the, it, it would be a quite a difficult way to, um, to program that explicitly. But what you could do is you could use a whole bunch of uh, pictures of me at different angles and different types of lighting. And then you basically be able to get kind of a generalized view of what my skin color is, you know, where my eyes are at, so on and so forth. And then compare those alongside uh, pictures of other people and then reason with reasonable accuracy, be able to identify 
a picture of me. Now, the thing, the, the key thing to understand when it comes to machine learning is that it doesn't explicitly know that that's a picture of me. It's not, it doesn't understand that on that level. What it understands is that, you know, all it really sees at the end of it all are pixels, you know, are pixels of my skin color, the, you know, where the, uh, where the color of my eyes is in respect to, you know, the lightest part of my nose, that is all it really understands, you know, and that's all it really sees at the end of the day. So this is, so really at the end of it all, all we're talking about are data sets, you know, that's just statistics that we're giving. Large numbers. Large, yeah. You know, basically all a photo of Josh is, is a three dimensional set of numbers. It has red, green, and blue, values for width and height coordinates. Uh, so you have this three-dimensional tensor of information that you shove in, and in this case, into a neural network, because at the moment, neural networks are the state of the art in image processing. Mm. So you, you shove this thing in, and then it might have lots of layers, and you have these low-level layers that would just look at colors and gradients um, of, of the pixels, and then it might, higher up layers might have a, hair detector or a nose detector and eyes and then you might have a face detector at the highest levels of the neural network and then it would spit out in this case because we're doing a classification task uh the class josh if it was trained correctly and if i put leon in maybe it would learn to say leon and so we have this leon and josh mm. neural network classifier. <laughs> um, yeah I think I, I think you I think you brought up a couple really interesting concepts there, which is talking about what you know, kind of on a high level of understanding what a neural network is. I mean, I say this having not having implemented a neural network myself, but just kind of my understanding of a neural network. You don't have to. Someone else has already done it for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the 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 real so so you have kind of basic uh kind of building blocks of machine learning so you have these different algorithms uh you have like ones like k nearest neighbor um you have uh naive bays you have dynamic time warping you have these um different algorithms that are good for different tasks and a neural network can take um, something that's a complex that's that's a complex task, and what you can do is you can kind of pick out a couple different uh, algorithms, and then you can optimize those in a way that will help you create kind of a really complex um, a, a really complex model that you're able to build your build your classifier, or build your algorithm on that consists of a couple different layers of um, of algorithms that are used together to maximize the effectiveness of, um, of your machine learning. Is that, does that yeah. sound fair? No, I think, I think generally, you know, <coughs> you can have like many, many different ways that you might solve a given problem. Um, mm. and you can use many different algorithms for your classification problem, such mm. as in your work or a, k-means whatever or your regression problem which i'm sure we'll cover but mm -hmm. you know often you just need one algorithm and you can test some against one another and find out which one works better and a lot of the time it's just down to hand tuning the algorithm that you like the most and that will give you the best result mm -hmm. the neural networks these days i mean classical machine learning started out with handmade features and you know, you might have a single perceptron taking that and having an output. And then the later sort of iterations of neural networks have been about adding more and more layers, increasing the width and different types of uh, constructions, I guess. Mm. And anything. But, you know, that's, that's a whole different thing. But mm. you get compositions of layers. And neural networks aren't particularly complex when you break them down into their individual components mm -hmm. I, I feel like i should say that before i go into all of this for anyone who's watching if you're not a mathematician that's fine i'm not i'm pretty sure josh you're not and like no. yeah it, it doesn't obviously it helps because neural networks deep learning machine learning it's all based on mathematics um but 
we've kind of got to this point where people can hack around with this stuff. There's enough great tools out there, which I'm sure we'll cover, that you can just get involved without worrying too much about the maths. It obviously helps, and I would advise anyone who deeply wants to understand the topics to hmm. you know, get stuck in and find a book on it. But, you know, it's not, it's not super important. And all a neural network is is a bunch of multiplications, additions, and then a non-linearity and some well-known ones, uh, rectified linear units, which is just a simple, if, if the value is less than zero, then return zero, else return the value. Or there's something called a sigmoid or a tan H. You know, we don't need to go into all of that stuff, but it's actually the maths behind it isn't that complex. But when you compose lots of layers in these deep neural networks that we have today, mm. they're learning these really, uh, you know, hard and interesting representations that are solving some real problems today mm. that uh, would be very hard to program by hand. Uh, for example, our Leon and Josh detector. I'm not sure what rules I would program by hand to detect uh, the color values of Josh versus Leon. I think I'd get that wrong quite a lot. It might take me a few hundred years. To <laughs> I'd look a little weird. <laughs> if it's facial hair, then it probably isn't me. <laughs> cool. Okay, let's... Um... I, I think we'll stop. All of them. I sort of went on a ramble there for a bit. But, um, yeah, yeah, no, that's all right. I think that's all very informative. Um, and uh, and hair, if if it has hair, it's probably not <laughs> probably not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. I think let's talk about let's talk about two more things before we wrap things up. Uh, let's talk a little bit about classification versus regression. So you know, you have these two different types of um, kind of coming up with a solution or two different ways of coming up with solutions to a problem. Um, so, problems, I think more than anything, you know, what's, what's that? It's, it's, well, between classification and regression, it's mm. two types of problems. Um, yeah. 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 Sorry. So, yeah, I'll, I'll give a shot at it. Um, so, you, so you basically have classification um, and I think, you know, pictures between, uh, you know, is it Leon or is it me, uh, would be a good way to go. So basically you have classification. Classification is where basically what it'll do is it'll classify. Uh, and you have um, a number of different kind of classes or outputs that it could be one of, but it can't be anything in between those things. It has to be, you know, like for um, for a classification problem, is it Leon or is it Josh? Then basically it would either be, Leon or it'd be me, you know, it couldn't be anything else. Yeah. Then you have regression. Regression is more of, you know, you have a picture of Leon, you have a picture of me, and then you combine, um, then basically you can go like somewhere in the middle of that. And it would be like a picture that would be somewhere between Leon and me. So it'd be like me with hair or Leon without hair, <laughs> you know, something like that. So that's, yeah. that's more like regression. And so those are the, those tend to be the, uh, would it be fair, a fair statement to say that those are really the two main outputs that you would get with machine learning, like either regression, you know, it's either a regression problem or. A yeah. Class. I mean, I, I guess they're the two ones you're going to worry about really. Um, yeah. Yeah. Into it, yeah. Yeah. So, like, well, audio, you know, you could have something that, you know, maybe, you know, you have a snare drum, you, you have a snare drum, and then you have a machine learning algorithm that could find like the closest, the closest snare drum to a target snare drum or the furthest or the furthest snare drum from, from the target snare drum. Yeah. Or you could have a machine learning algorithm that looks at two sounds and it, gives you a numerical value of their similarity between the two. Yeah. So you know, like you input the, the inputs is two, two sound, two representations of a sound, and then you get this scaling number, a scalar. And I think that's probably a good way to describe a regression problem is if, if you're using scalars rather yeah. than having discrete classes, then it's regression. Otherwise, yeah. Mm. 
Yeah, you might have a VST in the future where it's like you put in two sounds and then it'll it'll be a slider and then it could be like like kind of towards the one sound but a little bit of the other sound or somewhere that's halfway yeah. in between those two sounds. Like that is a realistic I should create something like that, man. That's, that's that. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's that journey between the two sounds and you can obviously do it in different ways with amplitude, with frequencies, if you're going in the frequency domain, or maybe you learn a different, different representation with a neural network and do something like Ensynth, which I'm not sure if we've mentioned yet, yeah. but that's, that basically does just that in an incredibly non-real-time manner. So. I think there's obviously going to be work trying to make that more real time, but it's, mm. that's about saying I've got these two sounds. What does it sound like if I'm halfway between the two? What does a, a cat and a trombone sound when you blend the two and you're halfway between the two? Yeah. It's a great demo, um, and I'm sure I can send you some links and you can put those in the uh, description below, maybe. But um, yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. Let's, um, by finishing off. So, so as I've said, I think I probably said at a time or two, Leon's going to be doing creative machine learning series where he's going to kind of take us from the beginning, you know, from the very basic building blocks and really, you know, help us create useful, um, and starting off, of course, simple, uh, devices that, um, you know, show us the power of, of machine learning and audio. Um, I think before we sign off, maybe we should just take uh, a minute or two to talk about, you know, if, if somebody is curious about machine learning, some, uh, some resources that uh, we can kind of give them now to start off because I've got to finish my dissertation. You got to finish your, uh, what would they call it a thesis or a dissertation for your, yeah. Like same thing, you know, yeah, so um, I call it dissertation because it sounds complicated. Sounds, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds... zero words yet, so <laughs> 12,000 words. Yeah, it's been a journey, man. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's let's just talk a, a, like for a minute or two just about a couple different resources that uh, people can find in the meantime until we get this series up and running. Um, the first one, of course, that I think of is um, Rebecca Feebrink's Cadenz course, which is really excellent. Um, it basically was the course, one of the courses that I took um, this, this year at Goldsmiths. Uh, and she covers all different types of algorithms, uh, gives you demonstrations, gives you really awesome uh, insights into the advantages and disadvantages of them. And, um, yeah, she's, she's awesome. So it just, yeah, it really helped. I think everyone to get this intuition of what the algorithms are doing and, you know, it's not about coding the algorithm. So if you're not, if you don't feel that you're a strong coder, it doesn't matter. You know, you basically mm -hmm. get in there, you have a play with the data, see how that affects the algorithms and it, you know, really helps you get a feeling for what what will impact what when you're using it. Strongly recommend that Cadenzo course. And if not, just, just use Weconator. Download it, give it a Google. It's well known and respected, and it's a great way to get started with machine learning. Yeah, so so for people that don't know, Weconator is um, a app of Rebecca Feebrink's creation that, basically allows you to open the doors to machine learning all the way up to neural networks. Uh, and, uh, and it lets you do it in a really easy and simple, simple way. And, um, if you, if you download Weconator and use that alongside the condensed course, that'll really like get you up and running and taken off with machine learning and start getting you start getting the ball rolling for you. Um, yeah. Hmm. So those are the, those are the two ones that kind of come to mind. Um, Gene Kogan, Gene Kogan yeah. has some stuff to, as well, doesn't he? Um, I'll have to look, I'll have to look at the link. I know he's got some stuff. Um, he's got quite a, he's got quite a bit on YouTube and stuff, demonstrations and talks and lectures and stuff. Doing, he's writing a book I think called machine learning for artists. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing struggle for him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's a really great resource, and I think he's got other people who've got on board. You should definitely check out his website because mm. it's just so 
great tutorials on there and he's been a long time con contributor to open frameworks and I'm sure many other um, open source yeah. libraries. And another great person to check out is mm. Memo. Um, he, he's a goldsmith too. He's doing mm. a PhD at goldsmiths. I've seen the deep learning work he's doing. It's amazing. Um, and a lot of his work is just, you know, he's an internationally renowned artist, well worth checking out. Yeah. Now does a great TensorFlow course. Okay. Another goldsmith. Yeah. Yeah. Big shout out to Goldsmiths. We love you guys. And girls. We love you guys yeah. and girls. Yeah, yeah. got to make sure. But no, he's, he's done a great Cadenze course on how to use TensorFlow. You know, yeah, I've been meaning to take that actually. Um, yeah, people have been telling me that's amazing. And then, of course, the classic uh, machine learning. Um, is it Aaron Ng? Aaron Ng? Um, Andrew Ng. Andrew Ng, that's it, that's it. Andrew Ng. Uh, so, so that's the, um, you know, if you talk to anybody that's doing any kind of machine learning course and you say, where is the number one online resource to learn about machine le learning, it's this course, Andrew Ng. He's a professor at Stanford, I believe, and he is like one of the foremost authorities in the world on machine learning and, um, you know, if you just basically do all those resources that uh, that yeah. we just spoke about, uh, and you do them in the next couple months, you'll uh, you'll probably know more about machine learning than we'll probably know by the time we get around to doing this course. <laughs> but I, think um, I should just yeah. add, though, you know, if you if you just kind of want to hack around with things, I don't know where everyone's level will be, and I suspect most people won't have wrote any neural networks and obviously if you don't want to write any code just yet and you want to get intuition that's really valuable use Weconator if you want to get started in writing your own code then like Keras is probably like a great place to start it's yeah. probably the best documented library I know in deep learning mm. it's so good that TensorFlow have now incorporated Keras as a contributed module uh, so you know the great thing about TensorFlow is it's really great for deploying in production like if you actually I've got something working and you want it to run on a mobile, then great. If you've got a TensorFlow model, you can run that binary on Android, iOS, whatever, fairly easily. Mm. Uh, and Keras is great because it's this really opinionated way of writing neural networks. And you've got all these smart people who have said, well, you know, if you don't know, if you, if you want like dropout on your recurrent neural network, then we're going to give you variational dropout. Uh, you know, if you don't know what that is, then like, it's probably better that they just let them do that for you, you know, and like mm -hmm. Keras is just really easy in a few lines to construct neural networks and great examples, great place to start if you actually want to start programming your own mm -hmm. stuff. And actually, if you know what you're doing, then, and you haven't used PyTorch, check out PyTorch because I've been using that lately and it's like, it's the nicest way, it's so intuitive to hack around with. I just want to do a quick plug for PyTorch because I just, I've fallen yeah. in love with it lately. It's just been a real pleasure to write code with um yeah sorry yeah <laughs> were you daydreaming <laughs> uh and, and uh, I'll, I'll throw one more resource out there. Um, if you're a hardcore C++ guy like myself, um, th which is uh, the Rapid Mix API, uh, yeah. which is another kind of creation of kind of Urcam, Goldsmiths, um, Juice have contributed to it. Uh, I think it's going to be a library that's going to be included as a Juice module eventually. Um, and Rapid Mix API has a lot of the um, a lot of the algorithms that we've spoken about. I've uh, I've used Rapid Mix API quite extensively past two years, and uh, it's also big shout out to Mike Z. Mike Z is another uh, one of the one of the uh, authors of Rapid Mix API. Um, so Mike Z, you're the man. Yeah, I mean, like that's the great thing to try out potentially after you've had some fun with Weconator. It seems like a very yeah, yeah. logical next step from Weconator because really it's built to work just like Weconator and mimic how it yeah. works. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, I would say rapid mix API isn't the one if you're like, I don't know anything about machine learning. I'm just going to jump into rapid mix API. I think you'll, I think you'll find that you'll be in the deep end quite quickly. 
Um, you know, Rapid Mix API is great if you kind of have a generalized idea of, you know, different algorithms and then you're ready to just kind of start um, throwing those in and seeing, seeing the possibilities. I think Rapid Mix API is a great choice after that. Or, you know, as Leon said, after toying around with Weckinator and getting, getting some ideas for that. Cool. Um, I think that's a great place where we can end things. Uh, anything you want to say? Yeah. I'll just say that if anyone was watching this and particularly wants anything to be covered, then please like leave a comment and I'll do my best to cover that. I mean, I've got quite a few things that I'd like to cover, including sort of generative audio with neural nets and sound similarity and maybe even automatic programming VSTs and, there's lots of things that could be done. It doesn't actually have to be generative stuff. It could be, um, you know, it could be like controlling Ableton with your face and your webcam, which is more sort of weaponated stuff. But I could show you how to do that with mm. code. That was interesting. But you know, if anyone has any ideas, then it'd be nice to hear hear about that. And yeah, that would be awesome. And then I'll put that I'll put that out to the Discord chat as well. Um, you know, we'd love to hear any sort of suggestions or feedback even. Uh, and, you know, we'd love to hear what you guys would love to learn about. I, say, I keep on saying guys, but I, I mean guys and women as well. So I just want to say that sensitive time right now. So, um, yeah, everybody that wants to hear about, um, you know, machine learning or you have any ideas as far as what you'd like to learn or what would you like Leon to focus on? We would love to hear your feedback. Cool. All right. Well, um, yeah, let's, let's end things here. And thanks. Thanks a lot, Leon. I'm really like, I'm really anxious to get this going and, uh, yeah. Awesome, man. Awesome, man. Um, cool. I'll, uh, I will hit stop on this and I will see you soon. See ya. Yeah, great. Good stuff.